The traffic was heavy in downtown Toronto during rush hour. Driving slowly, we made our way along roads crammed with other cars, bike messengers, street cars, and jaywalking pedestrians. Tall buildings towered over us all around, glass-walled skyscrapers and concrete behemoths. Stopped at a red light adjacent to an alley, the stench of a dumpster overfilled with week-old seafood waste, and used diapers wafted over, making me gag. We were on our way to a baseball game, and my brother had found a cheap parking lot online. The only catch was that it was a bit of a hike to the Rogers Center, where the Blue Jays played their games. It was taking forever to get to the discount parking place, immersed in the heavy traffic. At one point, it took us 15 minutes just to make a right turn due to the constant crush of pedestrians and car traffic. It was a hot day. I was getting sick of driving, sick of other people flaunting their utter content for every single traffic law, not to mention basic human decency. The idea of 30 more minutes fighting through the city streets was too much to bear, and I pulled into the next underground parking garage I saw, telling my brother Noel that I would pay whatever the cost was myself. He looked shocked. Now, this place would be likely triple the cost. But he shrugged it off and said, I'd do what I liked. The steel sliding door rolled up on its tracks to let us in. They closed down, shut behind us, drenching the tunnel in near total darkness. I had to stop the car, turning on my headlights to see as we wound our way downward into the parking structure. There were very few signs in the dimly lit garage, only one-way street signs pointing to the left, then to the right, and telling us where to go. All the parking spots were filled near the top, so we continued going down the ramps, deeper and deeper into the parking structure. Cars were parked in every single spot. There was not one to be had as we went down through levels. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L. Wow, this is starting to get ridiculous, I said, as we entered section T. I've never seen a parking garage that goes down this far, Noel marveled as we turned another corner and descended even deeper. I started feeling dizzy from the constant turning in circles going down the ramps of the parking structure. Slowing down, I felt woozy for a moment. Then I started driving again, slowly at first. It felt like it was hard to breathe so far down beneath the earth, the air thick and suffocating. This place is huge, Noel said, as we got down to level X. It was starting to get more and more unsettling, driving downward in the darkness. It's just a never-ending sea of black cars. Every single one looked identical after a while, like they were mirror images of each other. They had dark-tinted windows, no logo to distinguish the brand, I mean, the make or the model. This place is starting to creep me out. Can we go back? Like, just reverse out of here, man? There's nobody behind you. I tried to go backwards, but found there was a sliding steel door blocking the path going back up. Seeing they were automated to let us go through, but then came back down once we were past. All of them functioned seamlessly on sensors so that we hadn't even noticed them. But I imagined dozens of them leading all the way back up, blocking our path. Something occurred to me, suddenly. Have you seen any doors other than those? I mean, any stairs leading up out of here? He shook his head. Lines of apprehension furrowed into his face. No, I, um, uh, haven't seen any people down here other than us, either. We got out of the car together and tried to lift up the steel door, straining with all of my strength. I tried to pull it up out of the ground. It wouldn't budge. There was no help intercom or any other way of getting a hold of someone running this place. Frustrated, I pulled out the tire iron from the trunk. It drove it between the pavement and the door, trying to pry it open. Yeah, it wouldn't budge. Even with all of my body weight trying to force it upwards, my hands were getting cold and going numb, and I realized it was chilly down here on the lower levels. Much colder than the balmy summer night up on the street. This was the first moment we began to suspect something was really wrong. I mean, still, we had no choice but to keep going downwards, it seemed. And there was nowhere else to go. After waiting for what seemed like hours for someone else to come through the door we decided to try going forward a little ways more. I just hoped at some point the ramps would lead us out and would bring us back to the surface. 
since that had been my experience with parking garages in the past, I mean, why, why would anyone build an underground parking facility with no exit at all? I started driving again. My hands gripping the steering wheel with white knuckles. My breaths were coming far too quickly and my heart was beating fast. I told myself to try to stay calm. Try to convince myself that this was okay, this, this was normal. Suddenly, the letters on the wall indicating which level we were on began to change. After the Z, they stopped being recognizable from our alphabet. Or, or from any other that I had seen on Earth. They appeared ancient. Druidic. Carved into the stone with precision. Other than that, the place was the same. Dim, flickering fluorescence glowing overhead. Black cars going on forever as you went down each row. Only the light seemed to be getting dimmer with each level we went down. And it was getting colder, too. I turned on the heater, trying to warm up the car. And that was when I noticed my breath was pluming frostily into the air with each breath. As was my brother's. What is this place? Noel asked. I didn't have any answer. The structure made no sense. It wasn't really a parking garage, though. That was becoming abundantly clear. We kept going down, deeper and deeper, feeling like Indiana Jones and his companions exploring a never-ending underground cavern. There was nothing to see, other than rows of black cars, one after another, each level the same until they weren't. At a certain point, the architecture started to look wonky. Now, I don't know how to describe it other than that. It was like, like a kid had drawn up the plans for it instead of professional engineers or architects. The cars were crammed closer together in places, almost touching each other at strange angles. In other sections, things were spaced far apart. We almost could have squeezed our car in between two others. Almost, but, like, not quite. And even if we could, there was nowhere to go. We had already established that there was no doors leading to stairs anywhere, no elevators or other points of egress, either. We went down to the next level. Simoleon. The car's roof almost scraped against the ceiling. The wheels nearly lifted off the ground as we rounded the bend in an uneven ramp. Okay, this place is seriously freaking me out, my brother said, gripping the oh shit handle on his side of the car. Me too, man. Me too. Clearly going down further was not working. We were just going deeper and deeper into the dark abyss of madness that this place held within it. But getting out of the car was no longer viable either. We were dressed in t-shirts and shorts since it was a hot summer day. But I can only guess how cold the temperature in the parking garage was at this point. Yeah, the heat cranked up to the maximum, and we were both still shivering. The gaslight began to flash yellow, catching my eye. I didn't mention this fact to Noel. Not yet. I didn't want to scare him any more than he already was. We continued going downward, the light now sparse and separated by huge gaps of distance. Sometimes only one defective light was flickering for an entire level, then absent entirely in others. Our surroundings were continuing to get stranger and stranger, no longer resembling a parking garage anymore, but... Cavernous hellscape. The darkness and the feeling of suffocating beneath the ground was becoming impossible to ignore. I began to hyperventilate with claustrophobia, feeling that we were on our way downwards towards our inevitable deaths, trapped far beneath the earth or... Or perhaps something much worse than death. Perhaps we would simply continue driving downward forever into blackness. Round and round in spiraling circles. Finally, the car began to sputter and die as it ran out of gas. I wished more than anything at that moment I had driven around with more than just a quarter of a tank. We would have had more time to think of a plan if I had just sprung for a fill-up the last time I had visited the gas station. Noel didn't seem surprised. He'd probably noticed the gaslight, too, and just decided not to say anything about it. As the car coasted to a stop in the pitch blackness, I looked around. It was pure darkness in all directions. We couldn't even see a few feet in front of the car, despite the headlights still running off the battery. The darkness was getting thicker, more tenacious, and suffocating all around us. I imagined it wouldn't be long before it finished us, you know, invading our lungs and our bloodstreams like a noxious gas, paralyzing us with dread before painfully poisoning us to death with our own terror. The car battery died abruptly, much faster than it should have, and we were plunged into complete darkness. I turned the key back and forth to no avail. The battery was done for. 
so were we. The sounds could be heard outside the car, sounds of movement, scurrying noises, scratching claws, raking against the steel doors of various nearby automobiles, long ear-splitting screeches getting closer. Something began to bump against the right side of the car, jostling it to the other side as we, as we shivered from the cold and grabbed hold of whatever we could to brace ourselves from what might come next. It felt like something huge was brushing up against the car, like a like a huge worm beneath the surface of the earth, using these tunnels as passage. For a while, it felt like the car would tip over. As the sound of the thing moved past outside, dragged on and on forever, but eventually it ceased, and the car settled back on its axles. It was silent again in the darkness. Freezing cold, lonely, despite the presence of my brother, mere inches away, I, I felt as if I would die down here. My life began to flash before my eyes as I waited for death to come in, in whatever form it would take. I remembered my phone suddenly in my pocket. The screen would give off a little bit of light, and that was a relief. It was still a signal somehow, even all the way down here, and just enough battery to type this up and send it out to you all as a warning. If you happen upon the parking garage, the one with too many levels, don't go down any further. Stay near the surface. Get out while you still can. And if you see a parking attendant, please... Tell them we're stuck down here. Help us. I never liked confined spaces. Especially underground. I've always been afraid of the dark despite my 36 years on this planet... My age has not cured me of this fear as much as I'd like to pretend it has. Perhaps because I've discovered over time that there are things which lurk in the darkness. Spiders, giant millipedes, rats, bats, other things which move and rustle and make sounds which we try to rationalize, explain away, but we can't. I prefer not to think about these things right now, though. Being trapped in an underground parking structure with no discernible exit was not sitting well with me. Another fear, one which I didn't even know I had, began blooming within me as I heard my brother's teeth chattering and the sound of it mixed with my own. Fear of freezing to death. That was a new one. At least for me. It was cold down in the bowels of the parking garage that was... Not really a parking garage. We had gone down some 200 levels, I guess. I had lost track after a while. It was hard to imagine that there was any benefit to exploring further. And regardless, our vehicle had died. And then it had run out of battery power as well as gasoline, leaving us blind and freezing and alone in the dark abyss. At least it was marginally warmer inside the car than outside of it. But that didn't help our morale knowing that we were going to freeze to death anyway, sooner or later. What are we doing? My brother asked, his speech broken from the cold. One thing was becoming more and more obvious to me. We couldn't just sit here waiting to die. Let's get out of the car. Let's keep going. That's all we can do. Maybe there's still some way out of this place. A big glowing exit sign somewhere that leads us to an elevator. An elevator, you know? I managed to say through chattering teeth. I could see it clearly in my mind's eye, similarly to a person stranded in a desert seeing a shimmering oasis far off in the distance. I felt like I could see the glowing red letters hovering above a doorway just a few floors down reading, Exit. Perhaps if we just kept going we could find it. Maybe it was just... false hope. But I needed to at least try. Oh, to hell with it. Let's do it, my brother said, opening his car door with a shaking hand. You couldn't have picked a better way to say that? I asked. But we were already outside. Our eyes were now adjusted to the darkness. We could see just barely enough to walk towards the next ramp without feeling completely blind. The movement got our blood pumping a bit, and we began to jog, feeling warmer from the exertion. Neither one of us mentioned the movement in the shadows we saw occasionally things hiding behind cars, ducking out of sight as we passed by, the sounds of things scurrying and scuttling along the pavement behind us ever so often. We didn't want to think about those things 
and pretended even to ourselves that they weren't real. But in my mind, I couldn't help imagining what they were. Giant millipedes. Huge spiders with hairy legs. Other things that walked with stilted strides using appendages that were unnaturally elongated. I didn't want to think about these things, but I did. I pieced together things from the shadows and added details where there were none. And I saw all of my worst fears in the blackness beneath the ground as we jogged. And then ran. I had a feeling Noah was seeing things too. Things no human being should ever be forced to witness. We kept running down the ramps for each level to the next one, basking in the occasional flickering glow of a dim fluorescent light, but then grudgingly moving on from it, feeling infinitely colder in its absence each time. Each level became more abstract, progressively warped from what it had looked like at the top. It reminded me of stacking cards or pennies to make a pyramid, how every imperfection at the bottom becomes amplified on the next level. That's what this place was. A crumbling, uneven house of cards. And not the Kevin Spacey kind. Ready to collapse at any moment. Except instead of being built from the bottom up, this one was engineered in reverse, as if things had been digging and excavating down here for a long, long time. Millennia. Eons. Going down to the next level, I noticed that it was massive. Far bigger than any of the previous levels. The distance between ramps had grown larger and larger until now. We had a walk of several football field lengths to get across level whatever. It was going to take forever to get to the other side. Unsure what else to do, we kept walking, our legs exhausted and our feet developing blisters. On and on we went down each strange and uneven ramp, twisting and turning deeper and deeper into the dark abyss. Our stomachs began to rumble from hunger pains, and I started to wonder just how long we had been down here for. With precious little battery left on my phone, though, I decided to save it for the time being. The levels grew larger and larger. We could still hear the things moving in the shadows, but they were far off now, distant and unbothered by us. Noelle and I saved our words and kept quiet, afraid of drawing attention to ourselves. Eventually, they weren't fluorescent lights anymore, they were simply holes in the pavement, with fires burning from within them. The source of the flames was indeterminate. We stood in front of them to warm our hands when we saw them at first, but quickly realized they gave off no heat. So we moved on. The flames felt warm at first, but then I realized they were just the sensation of my hands being scorched. It did nothing but burn our hands and left us feeling even colder than before. We moved on and I struggled to process what was happening. To make any rational sense of it, it felt as if my brain could snap at any second. My thoughts raced around in unhinged circles like dogs on a racetrack, trying to catch a fake rabbit on a stick, my mind flying further and further off its axis with each loop of thought. There's no way out. There's no way out. There's no way out. My mind told me stubbornly, and yet we continued down deeper and deeper. Suddenly, the huge cavernous room was cast in a dull glow of light from behind. I couldn't resist the urge to look around in every direction, trying to make sense of our surroundings and to see who or what was hunting us. We had heard them constantly, but never actually seen them. Looking up at the ceiling, I saw creatures black as shadows in a midnight graveyard. They were climbing with sticky feet like frogs, moving quickly along and following us, watching us. Only they were hanging upside down from the top of the cavern. Their eyes glowed like cats in the night, reflecting back at us. One dropped down suddenly and was gone into the shadows. The rest dropped down as well, disappearing. They didn't like to be seen. Is that a car? My brother asked suddenly. I turned around and saw there were indeed a pair of headlights coming towards us from far off in the distance. I think it is. I was far past the point of feeling like we would be miraculously saved by an occurrence. In fact, the sight of someone else down here with us only brought me closer to the brink of a complete nervous breakdown. The walls were starting to crumble in places I saw now. Occasionally, tremors would be felt beneath our feet, as if giant primordial creatures were battling each other below. And if we just kept going down, we'd surely meet them very soon. They would stop their fight to take a brief reprieve and a snack. Trying to clear these images from my mind, I focused on the car pulling up to us. I felt like I was dreaming as I watched Noel flagging the driver down with a hopeful look on his face. He was shouting something about us being trapped down here when the man rolled down his window and looked at us, appearing just as frightened as we were. The whole thing felt surreal to me, 
and I was becoming more and more convinced that this was a trap. Nothing down here had been how it seemed so far, after all. My paranoia was cranked up to eleven. Are you guys? Are you them? The people running this place? I just want out, please, let me out! The guy in the car was shouting out the window at us. The man was about our age, wearing a Blue Jays jacket, and I guessed he was on his way to the game as well. He had just gotten lured down here with a promise of close proximity stadium parking, same like us. No, we're not the people running this hellhole. We got trapped down here too, we just ran out of gas a while back. It's, it's freezing out here though. He looked hesitant for a moment, but then nodded. What the hell, hop in. I got nothing else to lose. We jumped in, thankful for the ride, and the car began to roll forward. I held my hands up to the heater, immediately rubbing them together against the blasting air, and felt them getting toasty after a few long minutes. Noel was doing the same, reaching up between the front seat to warm his frostbitten hands, and after a few minutes, he was warm enough to relax in the back seat. I was in the passenger seat up front. The vehicle had that nice new car smell. I took a deep breath of it. Quite a relief to be safe from whatever things were outside stalking us, though. My, my paranoia began to settle slightly. I introduced myself, and so did Noel. The guy introduced himself as Steve, saying that he was as clueless about this place as we were. He told us that he had been on his way to the baseball game as well before all this happened. The Toronto traffic jam had driven him off the road, same as us. Any idea what the hell this place is? He asked. No? By the looks of it, it's ancient, and way older than the parking garage up near street level. I asked the guy if I could plug in my phone, since it looked like he had the same charger as I did. It was plugged into the cigarette lighter, glowing a faint blue color. Yeah, go ahead. I turned my phone on and took a look at my post here, wondering if anybody else had any ideas how to escape. Damn. Thanks for all the suggestions, everybody. I should probably get this out of the way, since a few people were asking why I didn't just call the cops. And sorry, I guess I should have I should have been more clear. See, there's a weird Wi-Fi signal down here, labeled those same symbols. There's not actually cell service. So calling the cops is unfortunately out of the question. Any and all websites that could provide emergency services are also blocked, so... Kind of reduced to just using this. And playing Angry Birds, essentially. Good distraction. Not particularly helpful. Some people on here are saying that we should just keep going down further. I said to Steve and Nolan. Somebody DM'd me saying that they've been here before. You gotta go down to level 500 and that's where the exit is. Steve said he doubted it, but we could try. We rounded another corner and went down another level. Deeper underground by another few stories. Each floor was beginning to get a bit smaller again. Not as enormous as before, and I was wondering if the space would start getting tighter and tighter. More and more claustrophobia inducing as we continued. I really hope not. In the dim light of the car, I noticed something suddenly. There was no symbols or logos on the steering wheel or on the dashboard. There was no hood ornament either. The black car was completely unadorned. Just like... The rows of identical cars we'd seen all throughout this place. I glanced at Steve, and he smiled with large incisors glinting. His eyes reflected back at me in the dim darkness. Like a cat, or, or maybe a wolf. My brother and I were trapped far up beneath the ground, in a parking structure with no way out. The darkness which surrounded us was thick and suffocating. The fact that the air was recycled down here far more than should be legally allowed was not helping. I felt like I was breathing in my own recently expired carbon dioxide at all times, with less and less oxygen molecules to go around with each breath. I realized I was hyperventilating again, and I tried to will myself to stop. The realization that our would-be rescuer was actually one of the creatures running this place had set my fight-or-flight system into overdrive, it seemed. My hand was reaching for the passenger side door handle without any conscious effort on my part. It'd be a lie to say that I was surprised to find that there was no latch, lock, or handle to open it with, only smooth plastic and steel all the way across. I was wondering when you'd notice, Steve said, taking the next turn a little too quickly, speeding around the next corner, 
right down the ramp, deeper and deeper into the ground. The space inside the parking structure was getting tighter again. It had grown cavernous for a while, changing into abstract formations, and eventually looking like a natural cave system, full of huge caverns, but now it actually started to resemble a parking garage once more. Tight, close-packed, and claustrophobic. Lines which were not straight, but painted in that familiar, jaundiced yellow shade began to designate spaces for cars to park, and they were all full, of course. Notice what? Noel said from the back seat. There's no logo on the steering wheel, I said quietly, realizing it was pointless to pretend. My face had spoken volumes as my eyes had widened in fear, registering the fact that this car was not from our world. It was from down here. And so was Steve. Oh, shit. Steve pressed down hard on the gas pedal, spinning the wheels like a stunt driver as we went down another level. He was accelerating through the turns, not slowing down as one usually would. Flickering fluorescent lights overhead began to race by, faster and faster, reminding me of the water ride scene in Charlie the Chocolate Factory. Steve began to laugh maniacally as the lights illuminated his face in brief flashes. We sped past a never-ending parade of black cars, tightly packed together in long rows. They were sitting at warped angles and scraping against each other, as if they were life-sized Hot Wheels lined up haphazardly by an enormous, disgruntled toddler. The ceiling was getting lower and looked close to the roof of the car as we went down yet again around the bend of another ramp's distorted parabola. The vehicle kept gaining speed, and I grabbed the dashboard for support, since there was nothing else to hang on to. "'What the hell do you want from us? Why don't you just let us leave?' I asked, tensing up and slamming my foot down hard on the imaginary brake pedal on my side of the car. He didn't answer. He simply sat behind the steering wheel, grinning, laughing, and turning each tight corner quicker than the one before, looking unconcerned with the speed, like... And I felt I could vomit at any second." Noel looked at me and made the gesture as if to choke the guy from behind. I wondered if it would do any good. It was worth a shot, I guess, with no rational justification for the thought. Nodding at Noel, I waited for what would come next, ready to grab the steering wheel if necessary. At this rate, it seemed certain we would crash and he would kill us for sure if the car got any faster. Let us out of here, you freak! Noel shouted, putting his forearm against Steve's neck and gripping his other bicep with his hand. A perfect chokehold by the looks of it, except that Steve didn't seem bothered by it. It occurred to me immediately that, of course, that made sense. He's probably a demon or some sort of other dark creature born of this abyss. He seemed to not require any air, which... Would an underground creature need air? But instead looked satisfied with having none. The man continued laughing soundlessly, then let go of the steering wheel with surprised speed, just as we were coming around the final bend of another ramp. Before I could even react, the car slammed with violent force into the black sedan parked on the next level down. The world exploded into a deafening Bang! Glass and plastic fly everywhere, airbags that felt like they were full of lead deployed, slamming me hard in the face and knocking me unconscious. When I woke up, Steve was gone, and we were all alone once again. What was the point of that? I muttered. Noel had no answer for me. He shook his head, blood trickling down from his ear and from his scalp. Why had they abducted us just to let us go again? It seemed to be a no benefit to anyone. We just managed to travel a few dozen floors further down, but if that's where we were headed anyway, why would the creatures running this place try to help? Maybe because we were freezing to death? Had they actually been trying to save us? I wonder if they want us to get to the bottom, I said out loud. To nobody in particular. Noel was trying to get the car started again, but the key in the ignition was just causing an annoying chiming sound. It wouldn't turn over no matter how many times he tried. The front end was smashed in and the engine was no longer functioning by the look of it. There was no way that we could keep driving it. We'd be lucky to walk away with only bruises and scrapes, a couple of black eyes, some indeterminate head trauma. My bones made disturbing and unnatural crunching sounds as we walked away from the wreckage. I tried to crack my neck, but that seemed to make things substantially worse. You doing okay, man? I asked Noel as we walked. We know this isn't going to work. They're just drawing us in more and more. We're giving them exactly what they want. He seemed to think about it for a minute. You know what? Maybe we're doing what they want. But what the hell else can we do? 
There's no way back up. These damn steel doors are like bank vaults. There's no way to get through them all. Unless maybe we have a damn bulldozer. It's true. So what are we going to do? Sit on our hands and freeze to death? I sighed, realizing he was right. At least it's starting to feel a little warmer down here, and that's something, he said. Yeah, I guess that is something, I agreed. My fingers at least weren't numb anymore. It didn't feel like they could fall off at any second. Did you notice the cars? They're back, and I hate to say it, but it looks like... Looks a little bit more like an actual parking garage down here again. Like it looked at the top. Yeah, sure. But we're still down here. It seemed his reassuring observations ended there. We continued on in silence for a long time, walking down each ramp and then slogging through each subsequent level to the next. There was no denying it. Chaos was returning to an ordered state. The place looked more or less like a regular parking structure once more, and I remembered how we had been lured inside, shuddering at the memory. Neither one of us said it, but we were both thinking it. What if things started getting weird again, like the first time? What if we just kept going down and cycling through levels, or ordered normality, then more madness, then back to the normal again, over and over and over? The thought made me feel a little squirrely in the old noggin again, so I just tucked that mental image neatly away in the brain folder that I had for such things. Far, far at the back of the filing cabinet that was my memory bank. I didn't want to think about that now. I... I really didn't. We got to the bottom of the next ramp, and I walked straight into the steel sliding door. I'd been looking at my feet. Noel was a few yards back, staring at the door. At the top, written on a white sign in red letters, was the word, Street Exit. Huh? I looked around for a button, a, a way to make the door go up, suddenly feeling like a diver about to surface, desperate for a hit of sweet, sweet air. There was a little intercom box besides the door. It said, push button for assistance on it. And I wonder where it had been all my life. Specifically for the last day or more, we'd been trapped underground looking for a way out. I pushed the red button. Garbled voice came through the speaker. Can I help you? Can you let us out, please? I asked, waiting for the maniacal laughter to start right on cue. Our, our nerf gray. The voice said back, distorted and broken by static. Have a nice day, it had said. I realized as the door rolled up on its tracks. The sun was shining outside, so bright it caused us to shield our eyes with our hands. It took a long moment for my eyes to adjust. I was afraid, waiting for the light to become tolerable to look at. We had never come back up from the bottom of the parking garage. There was no way we were back at the entrance somehow. This had to be another trick, and yet... And yet... My mind registered the sounds of cars driving past. People walking, talking, birds singing, bees buzzing as they flew through the air. Stopping at flowers to make their withdrawals and deposits of nectar. I blinked my eyes and I looked to see the world as I had always known it. All around us, we were at the surface. Startled and confused, I spun around expecting to see the ramp going up. Instead, it was leading back down into the darkness. What the... I trailed off, unsure of what to say. How? My brother began, seeming to have come to a similar realization, scratching his head and looking down the ramp. This parking garage was even stranger than it seemed, apparently. It refined all reason and logic and the laws of physics as well. Instead of going up as the ramp should have, it was now aimed straight back down, as if, as if it had flipped upside down when we turned around. We stepped out into the sun. We looked up to see a skyscraper towering above us, the windows made of glass. Inside, people could be seen working at desks and drinking their morning coffee. It wasn't the home of a never-ending pit of despair, a chaotic abyss leading down into hell. It was just... It was just a regular old office building. I know we were walking down the whole time, so how are we back up here on street level? I don't know, man. I know we walked down that ramp, so it should be angled back up when we were looking at it, but it's not. Now it's going back down. He thought about it for a while before saying, 
Maybe it's like that magnetic hill. What? What are you talking about? But then I remembered. He didn't need to explain it any further because I knew the one that he was talking about. There was a semi-famous tourist attraction where people could put their cars in neutral at the bottom of a hill, which appeared to go up, and could sit inside while the car was pulled up to the precipice by a magnetic force. Except really it was just an illusion. The hill looked like it was going up, but it was actually just a less steep downhill curve amidst a bunch of others that made it appear to be a hill going up. In reality, you were going down the whole time. What was that? What had happened to us? You just thought we were going to go down all along when really, at a certain point, we had begun to ascend again. Maybe, I suppose, it could be. I mean, anything was possible, after all. But it seemed unlikely. I mean, looking back down the ramp, I shook my head. Not just unlikely, it was impossible. I I had walked down that ramp to get to this door, not up. I was sure of it. And yet my eyes betrayed that memory. Oh, this is seriously freaking me out. Let's get away from this place, okay? I can't look at it anymore. Deal. The two of us started walking again, leaving the parking garage behind. I looked with disbelief at the street signs and the billboards all around us. At first glance, it was all normal. After satisfying ourselves with the fact that we were finally out of the dark hellhole beneath the ground, I flagged down a taxi. It would cost a fortune for them to take us back to Hamilton, but it'd be good to finally get home. It wasn't like we could use our own car, after all. It was stuck down in the bowels of the parking garage. I whistled loudly and raised my hand into the air. A yellow taxi cab pulled up to the curb almost immediately. We climbed in, sat down, relaxed on the soft seats. Where to, fellas? The man asked in a strange, high-pitched voice that sounded like two small people speaking at once. He turned to face us in the back seat. My words caught in my throat as I was unable to get them out. The cabbie's eyes had dry, crusted red lips like mouths. Inside, instead of irises, were teeth and tongues. He was speaking through his eye holes, I realized. His mouth was one large, unblinking eyeball. It opened and closed, observing us passively, then with a grave-looking frown. Then he began to scream. The sound of it was awful and ear-splitting. It took me a few long moments to figure out what I wanted to say, but by the time he finished screaming, I had decided on a plan. There was no other choice. It was the only way. Back down. Do you know any place where I can rent a bulldozer, my good man? It looked as if we weren't home free just yet. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on the conclusion of this series, I want to let you know about a book from tonight's author, Jordan Group. Beneath the Asylum is available now by Jordan Group. There's a link to the Amazon in the description down below. And now, on to tonight's story. Noel and I thought we escaped the underground parking garage when we finally found an exit door. Fortunately for us, there was a problem when we got on the street level. After descending 500 floors or so, I should have known there was going to be an issue when that door opened and we walked right out into downtown Toronto. It was far too easy after all we'd been through. This was still downtown Toronto, but this... This was some other version of it. I had heard of the multiverse theory that there were infinite other dimensions, trillions upon trillions of them. Some versions were only slightly different from ours, while others were completely unrecognizable. But I never would have guessed that all dimensions hinged on a single point in downtown Toronto. A dirty, squalid parking structure off Spandina. It was only once we got into the taxi that we realized the difference in this place. The cabbie looked at us like we were freaks, screaming with twin mouths where his eyes should have been. At the bottom of his face, one giant cyclops eye stared at us with disbelief, wide and afraid. We screamed right back at him, and I vaguely remember asking him something about a bulldozer before jumping out of the cab and running back towards the parking garage. It was terrifying in there, but 
out on the street was much, much worse. Every cyclopic stranger who passed by glared at us with mounting suspicion, some whispering to each other and hurrying away with quick steps. I heard a few stifled screams and one woman dropped a bag of groceries she was carrying and simply ran in the other direction at the sight of us. This... this was not our world. And who knew what they would do to us here if they found out about our existence? Fear of what might come to be started to rise up within me more and more. We were far too exposed on the busy downtown street. I imagined other aliens who looked like the cabbie, but they they wore white lab coats and had us strapped steel tables while they, they prodded us with long needles and electrodes, torturing us with never-ending experiments. We couldn't risk that happening. I told my brother we had to get back to our world as quickly as possible. The steel sliding door was closed when we got back to the parking garage. We pounded on it with our fists and waited for it to go up. But it didn't. I noticed a discreet intercom on the left of the parking garage entrance. After pushing the button, a fuzzy, distorted voice answered back. Could you let us in, please? No, no, for the vehicle. The hell is he saying? Noel seemed to have a better ear than I did. Not without a vehicle, not pedestrians. <sighs> Shit. It was difficult to hide our faces from the passing people as we milled about near the entrance, loitering while we waited for a car to go inside. We put our hands over our faces and sat against a nearby wall, hoping to avoid detection while we waited for our opportunity. Luckily, within about five minutes, another car came by and pulled up to the automated door. It rattled open and we ran over, ducking inside just as the door closed behind us. The ramp led down into the darkness and I felt immediately as if something was wrong. This just looked like an ordinary parking structure now. We got down to the first level and saw families getting out of their vehicles. Cyclops people with upside down faces who were coming and going, living their lives, going to work with briefcases in hand or returning to their cars from shopping trips with handfuls of bags stuffed with clothing and other items. In other words, it was just a regular parking lot. Not the weird, never-ending, bottomless one we had been visiting previously. What the hell? Noel muttered as we went down another level. It's the same building, right? This isn't it, though. Who hit? How did we get back? I wish I knew. We went down level after level, going down the ramps instead of using the stairs like we were supposed to. It was how we had gotten there, after all, but it drew attention to us. By the time we got to the bottom, it was clear that this was not the same place. The ramps going down ceased abruptly, and we noticed there was there were security guards waiting for us on the quiet lowest level, where nobody was parked. What the hell are you guys doing? Let me guess. You don't have a car down here. We've been watching you on the cameras, and... The squeaky, high-pitched double voice of the one guard cut us off when he saw our faces. What? What the hell are you? The other guard asked, pointing his flashlight straight into my eyes. Jerry, get the cops over here! This isn't right! My heartbeat pounded with fear. I turned and I tried to run, telling Noel to follow me, but there was more guards on the next level up. And the next. Despite our attempts to escape, pretty soon we were surrounded by them. There was no chance for fighting them, I realized. They had flashlights and walkie-talkies and we were clearly outmatched. Instead, we went semi-peacefully to their security office. We were exhausted and had little fight left in us after our journey through the parking structure and its hundreds of floors. They dragged us into the security office and put us in a stuffy interrogation room. The surreal upside-down faces were hard to look at, and I got the impression they felt the same about us, making disgusting noises as they closed the door on us. After being left alone in the windowless room, we sat sweating, waiting for the authorities to arrive. The idea of being dragged further away from this parking structure and thus from our reality filled me with a terrible sense of dread. How would we find our way back here? Would we be stranded in this dimension forever, forced to endure the aforementioned torture and experiments by cyclopic aliens with white lab coats? My panic, terrified thoughts were interrupted when a picture frame fell off the wall across the room from where we were sitting. I noticed the floor was rumbling slightly beneath my feet. My heart, my heart rate began to increase rapidly. Was it the demons? Were they coming after us? 
There was a muffled ding sound that could be heard from behind the wall. Then a vertical seam opened in it, a line which stretched about seven feet high and opened in the wall, cracking the paint and sending flakes and chips off it onto the floor. The crack in the wall opened up suddenly, the gap widening like an elevator door. When I looked inside, I saw that it was indeed what it was. But this was no ordinary elevator. Standing inside of it were a pair of men in sharp-looking charcoal gray suits, wearing sunglasses despite the low light from the room. They were nondescript and clean-shaven, their hair cut short and uniform. If I had been asked to describe them to a sketch artist ten minutes after meeting them, I would certainly not have been able to. I'm struggling even now to remember these details, and I mean, they could be wrong. There's a chance their suits were blue, they had long gray beards, they weren't wearing sunglasses at all, but fancy monocles like the, like the planter's peanut guy. The hell are you boys doing all the way down here? The one on the left asked us. Or maybe it was the one on the right. I didn't know what to say other than the truth. So, so I told them what happened. They looked at each other with concern. Damn, another breach. We'll have a long chat with the boys downstairs. We can't be messing with the fabric of reality like this, no matter how bad the parking situation in hell is. Well, I did say this was going to be a problem. Can't expect demons to build anything up to code. Yeah, when you're right, you're right. And you would know. Idiots upstairs should have listened. Noel and I looked at each other with utter confusion. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, who are you guys? They seemed to have forgotten we were standing there and shrugged to each other, motioning for us to follow them to the elevator. Don't worry about it, kid. We're just, just looking out for people like you. That's our job. We got into the elevator and the wall closed up behind us, sealing us inside. Then the box began to go up. The numbers on the display went up as well. They turned into letters and then symbols. ZZZ99, AO Box L, AO Box Backward L, AO Box Y, AO Box Down. It cycled through faster and faster. I felt my stomach getting forced downwards unpleasantly. My inner ears ached. Here, kid, have some gum. One of the guys handed both of us some grape flavored hubba bubba, and we chewed it quickly, swallowing to try and get our ears to pop. They did after a while, and I felt marginally better, but still more scared than I'd ever been in my life as the elevator flew upwards at increasingly higher speeds. Can you guys explain what just happened, please? I asked. What's the deal with the parking garage? The two guys looked at each other, but the one who looked more senior eventually nodded at the other. Well, it, um, it started off as just overflow parking for the dicks downstairs, but eventually started using it for other purposes. They're... They're big on torture devices inspired by real-life transgressions down there, so just for a hypothetical, imagine you're one of those people who parks in a handicapped spot and takes up two parking spots on purpose, you know, all the time. You end up roaming that never-ending parking lot for eternity. It's pretty clever, I'd say. Using it for both purposes, you know, two birds, one stone, and all that. Um, okay, that makes a really weird sort of sense, I guess, but... What about the other Toronto? Was that hell? Because it... That doesn't quite feel right. Oh, no, nah, it's just... Well, think of the universe like a big onion. It was just the next layer down. You weren't supposed to be there. It's really bad, actually. Did you, did you get into one of those cars with a demon when you were down in the parking garage by any chance? Yeah, we thought that he was stuck down there, too. Turns out he was one of them. I shuddered, thinking back to Steve and... How he had terrified us driving through the parking garage in his car, traveling much faster than he should have been possible. That makes sense. Somebody who has the ability to travel between worlds has to take you back and forth. They're trying to create a hole in the fabric of space-time. Not for the first time, either. Does this sort of thing happen often? Noel asked. They shared another look. Uh, more and more these days. Nothing we can't handle, though. I hoped he was right about that. I didn't want to find out what would happen if they failed their job. Something occurred to me. Hey, I've been looking to change careers. What kind of background do you need to do your job? It seems like you could use all the help you can get now. The guy on the right slapped the other's arm. 
This guy here was an elevator repairman until not too long ago, but you'd be surprised how much overlap there is between the two professions. Between... Between elevator repair and... Wait, what are you guys exactly? Uh, just think of us as guardians. There are forces at work who would prefer this universe did not exist. They want everything destroyed so they could start from scratch. Make it how they want. We try to prevent that, or at least limit the damage. Think of the universe like an expanding bubble. I thought you said it was an onion. He looked annoyed for a moment. Sometimes it's an onion. Sometimes it's a bubble, okay? Damn it. I forgot what I was going to say. He paused, looking at his feet, trying to remember. You guys are missing out on some really profound and interesting shit now because you're interrupted. That's all I'm going to say. Jeez, sorry, but hey. Thanks for saving us, though. We owe you guys one. Yeah, you're welcome, I guess, he said sulkingly. We rode in silence for a little while longer, and eventually I could tell that we were starting to get closer to the top. The symbols representing which floors we were on becoming more abbreviated on the elevator's displays, then eventually turning into letters again. Can I ask one more question? Noel tried as we neared the top. He was clearly just as curious about all this business as I was. Shoot. Is this the only junction between worlds? This nasty parking garage, because... It's pretty messed up if it is. Oh, nah. No, nah, there's plenty of other ones. There's a giant oak tree, a late night city bus, an old mall somewhere, not to mention the... That's about enough of that, partner, the other man said, squeezing his shoulder. We try to keep a few secrets for ourselves, remember? Plausible deniability? What if they got a hold of these two and tried to extract some info? He looked at us and apologized for his friend. Sorry, he's new. Still working on the whole discretion part of the job. The other guy looked sheepishly at his feet again and apologized for oversharing. It's okay. Don't let it happen again. The elevator door rumbled open on its tracks and the world as we knew it revealed itself to us once again. Here we are. GXR 187. Outside were the corridors of an office building. People with normal faces and the right number of eyes and mouths walked past us as we stumbled out of the elevator. The wall closed up behind us, but nobody seemed to take any notice. Whoa, nobody saw us coming out of that interdimensional elevator? Noel said. I think it's got a cloaking device or something. I looked around. No, I... I don't think so. Everyone was simply looking at their phones. Nobody paid us any mind as they stared at their screens. If we could have had two heads, they wouldn't have even noticed. Two mouths and one eye. We left the building and stepped out onto the street. I inhaled deeply and breathed in the smoggy downtown Toronto air, exhaling it with coughing and darting glares from passers-by. <sighs> home. Finally. We were home. Now that I'm safe, back in my apartment in Hamilton, I wish I could say to you that everything is okay. That everything turned out all right. But I keep thinking back to the words the man in the gray suit said in the elevator. What if they get a hold of these two? I keep hearing voices in the darkness at night, from the shadows and in the hidden places, whispered voices in harsh tones, but when I check, there's nobody there. Maybe we aren't as safe as we thought. Maybe they're coming for me one of these days to try to find out what I know. I wouldn't put it past them the demons from the parking structure. I wouldn't be surprised if, if they came for me in my sleep. If you don't hear from me again, you can assume that's what happened. I'm resigning to it. I can't stop it. I only hope the Guardians can live up to their name. That they can stop them. Otherwise, we're all in a lot of trouble. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepasta. And I wanted to tell you thank you for watching today's video on YouTube or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. If you guys like hearing stories being told here on YouTube slash podcast slash wherever you happen to be listening to stories being told, then you can always get some behind the scenes stuff. Check out twitch.tv slash MrCreepyPasta, and sometimes I go live there. That's basically the end of the statement. <laughs> sometimes I'm live. 
a lot of the times I'm not. Sometimes when I'm live, I play video games. Majority of the time when I'm live, I'm attempting to work, but also I get wrapped up in talking about life stories or things. So if you ever wanted to know me outside of th 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 this, then hey, uh, just check out twitch.tv slash mrcreepypasta. And I want to give a big thank you, as always, to all of my Patreon subscribers on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs. You are the ones that allow me to do stuff like getting specific stories just for the channel. If you guys want to see more of that, then I would really, really, really love if you guys could help support on Patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta like some of these wonderful guys such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Chaos Arts, Cryolinian, Milk and Meal, Silty K. Sterlerson, Zachary Graphius, It's All About That Fucking Music, Gorang Trimegacy, Maria Walker, Tanya Oren, Pain Gravy, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ika Limchok, Dirt Diver 030, Matt Bach, Dabbles Rat, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Chelly J, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Ficomel, Nana, Nick Weaver, Melted Lake, Tolly Sue, Sky Mara Ravenswood, William King, Darth Milver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Butterhawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Sazaku, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Nicholas Sicardi, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, the Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. You guys, as well as everybody, if you look down in the description, and everybody that can even just give one dollar to be able to help things out, I really appreciate it. If you guys would like to join this list of names that I horribly, horribly mispronounce, check out patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, and honestly, even you guys who just listen, you watch, you comment, you like, you subscribe, thank you all. I really appreciate it. And sweet dreams.